Welcome to Art Talk. I'm your host, Jim Tripp, in the spirit of art. And tonight's guest, Al Dugas, he's a shamanic artist, and he brought some beautiful works with us to see. And I'd like to introduce Al. Al, how you doing? I'm doing very good, Jim, and thank you for having me on your show. Yeah, I'm glad you could join us. Now, what, a, what is a shamanic artist? Well, to take it back just a bit, I think uh, in our culture, the artists are the shamans, the, the seers, the merrymakers, the dreamers, those that can bridge the gap between ordinary and extraordinary. Hmm. Extraordinary. <laughs> the shaman as, as, is an anthropological name giving to those that do the work of healing, uh, where doctors don't exist, where medical intervention isn't there. Uh, right. The he healer is there, the shaman. Is it well, healing of the mind or? Sometimes it does. Sometimes it involves healing of the mind. Uh, sometimes healing of the body, healing of the spirit, uh, lose a connection with that spiritual part of our nature. Hmm. And I think a lot of us in Western culture have lost connection with the spiritual side of our nature. There's more to us than a physical matter. So, oh wow. So these are actually healing tools that you brought. Some of these abso the absolutely are tools uh, and, and healings of tools. Would you like to demonstrate any of them? Well, yeah, I'd love to see this. These are beautifully done. Uh, a piece like this one right here, and it's a little bit bigger than need to be, uh, it's an object for creating a sacred circle. Uh, sacred circle. When the operator, uh, there's an Ojibwe Sundance priest in North Dakota that uses one, and there's also a shaman in Brazil that uses one, and, and others. It's a blend of stone and bone. It's used in opening up the circle and creating a sacred circle. Show the circle. end of this to the camera a little bit. I don't know if the camera can pick this up. Look at the way Al has fused all the different uh, stone and uh, what kind of stone is here? Is oh, all... there's, there's amethyst, there's turquoise, red coral, jet. Malachite, uh, abalone, and it's, it's absolutely beautiful. You know, when you make a cake, you have many different ingredients that goes into it, and when you make a sacred tool, there's many ingredients that go into it to make this new object. And the way you fuse them all together, it looks like it was almost made that way. I mean, it blends so smooth and nice. That the, the result of uh, a physical piece of sculpture. Is this how you would hold this? Tool? You'd hold it like that, absolutely. The amethyst it fits, protects, it fits right in your hand. protects the operator. And this is what touches the earth. The, the antler is what touches the earth. As the creature itself has to be taken in consideration. The antlers give us boundaries. The antlers give us that space. You know, we don't violate the space. Don't come any closer than the length of that antler. Uh -huh. The amethyst protects the operator. The blue and the turquoise uh, signifies our spiritual path. Your spiritual path. So these just uh, hone, they bring you in tune with nature. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, getting away from that technological 
influence that bombards us, lights, electricity, AC electricity especially, bombards electromagnetic fields, mm -hmm. and the animal products soothe that. They give off negative ions that are very healing to us. Well, wood versus plastic. Wood versus plastic. Uh. Wood's a conductor, plastic is rather static. Yeah, and pollution. Well, Plastics yeah. and pollution go together. <laughs> That's what we've been led to believe. <laughs> yeah, it seems, it seems to be that way. And, but, but it is a product that we created, and it, it came from petroleum and mm -hmm. from the oil that's within the earth. And so it is created here on earth, but, we, but it's been a manipulation by man. Yes. So, now you, you didn't always do this type of artwork, did you? No, I didn't. Uh, very young, during uh, grade school and high school years, I did a lot of painting and studied in the, in the fine arts program at NFA, and I painted a lot of automobiles and teen angels on the skirts and fenders mm -hmm. of cars. And My father was a stonemason, and I served an apprenticeship as a stonemason. Well, you're so still that, working with stone. I'm still working with stones. Yes. Uh, went to several art schools. Uh, but it wasn't until I had a, a blood disease, I was a cancer patient for 13 years, that rendered me sensitive to the needs of the earth and why why am I here and I had to address some of that. So you had to step back and rethink. I had, I had to step back, rethink and, and retool. So how did you find this way when you were sick? Well it wasn't so much when I was sick as but when I became healed in uh, the late 70s. I was that was Fortun pretty dramatic. Fortunate enough to, to be healed, then, then why me? Because we all don't think of ourselves terribly well. You know, we know our innermost secrets. And so I said, well, why was I saved? And during this process, I had a studio in Newport, and I started carving a lot of bone, old fish bones and deer antlers and deer bones. And it was like the prelude to what I'm doing here, but it stopped for a while. I had to almost go through another eight-year period of searching and had a glitch. discovering, yeah. yeah, and look and, and seeking out different masters to work with and see why and what led them to this process. And so you've studied with other people. Yes, yes. I, I studied with Brazilian shaman and I've studied with some of the elders, uh, some indigenous elders throughout this country well, that and this continent. Really fascinating. That yeah, must have been incredible. Did did you study with them here or down in Brazil? I studied with them here. The Brazilian shaman comes to Connecticut very often, yeah. So I was very fortunate there. Um, some of the indigenous and native people, I went to their homes in North mm -hmm. Dakota, uh, Montana. Right. It's, it's Arizona, New Mexico. That's a powerful spot. It, it is, not only is it a powerful spot, it always has been. Um, some of that four-corner area is, is so sacred that it God's has country. been for millennia, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I've been out that way myself. Uh, well, let's. Why don't we take a trek up to your studio? Well, you that'll be tickle me plum to death, yeah, you Jim. You invited us <laughs> up. I think we should go. Let's go. Okay.
studio. We're in Mystic, Connecticut right now. And that noise you heard was were these drums. They're pretty fascinating drums. Can you Al, can you tell tell us a little bit about them? Well, there came a time in my life I I was real disturbed about seeing roadkill in the road and I started picking them up and burying them. Uh, I learned how to yeah, dehair them. A lot of that here. You can make drums out of them. Uh, very therapeutic. Four years ago, I didn't know why I was making drums. And Robert Bly started doing workshops with men, uh, a lot of female workshops going on. And people picked up the drum again. It's a very primal and therapeutic tool. Uh, therapeutic? What do you mean is uh, therapeutic? You can express yourself from who you are through the beat of the drum without trying to be real articulate. You can express your energy, your uniqueness through the beat of the drum and feeling part of the collective while you beat. So you do this in groups? Sometimes, yeah. Yeah. Uh, although a lot of these drums are like prayer drums where you can beat the drum 
and you might be lamenting, you might have a great joy you want to just express with, without words, and you play the drum. Sort of a meditation. Wonderful meditation. Meditation. Too, yeah. So as you drum, you just sink deeper and deeper into the meditation. The drum beat becomes your lifeline. Um, that's how you find your way in and find your way out again. It's yeah. that inner journey. The Native Americans and Native cultures all over the world. Yeah, all, all indigenous all people. All drum. All, always use drums and many, many still do today. Now, was that primarily for uh, communication? One part of it was communication. Um, many ceremonial and uh, celebratory times when we're in feasts and celebrations. We come together with our voice, we come together with our physical body, we come together with our uniqueness, and we share that in the community through drumming. Hmm. Now, how long have you been drumming? How long Not as long as I've been a sax player. I've been a sax player a lot longer, so <laughs> drumming uh, five years now, I'm making five drums years. and playing drums. Hmm. Just, just another remnant, earth remnant. Um, they have really nice drums, beautiful tone sound to each one is different each hide will have it, its own uh, vibratory rate each, each hide has its own thickness so each each hide has its own voice each drum will have its own voice and its own personality now well, i noticed this personality these are these are bones here aren't they that one has a deer bone <laughs> handle uh, this one has a horse bone handle here uh friends brought it back from viegas they were vacationing down there. there's a lot of wild horses so i mm. tried it it's a very big one actually it's kind of heavy but it has a wonderful sound so these pieces come from everywhere everywhere yeah all over you do a lot of trading they're good tradings yeah, yeah. they're great value hmm. the rattles too are in a bit in, ex in exchange for not having a drum you could use a rattle or, or others can rattle with them because that same vibrational energy it also goes with the dance, I believe, right? Dance too, yeah. <laughs> dance to the beat of the drum. A different drummer. Now, what do we have here? We have all kinds of beautiful... Here we have a pipe, a uh, very traditional pipe. Uh, that is. With a willow stem uh, made out of catlinite and also known as pipe stone. This one is inlaid with turquoise and represents pipe the four stone. corners. Pipe stone, is that a special kind of stone? Uh, it's, is that it's, the name of the stone? The, the common name is pipe stone. It's referred to as catlinite. It's found only in western Minnesota. It's the only vein in catlinite. the United States and the world, I believe. Native and indigenous people have always used this to make their pipes out of. That is beautiful. Now, you were saying turquoise are in certain this positions. Turqu in different positions, representing the directions. The directions of the, of the compass? The gateways, the gateway to the north, where the old ones live, uh, the gateway to the west, where we're all traveling, uh, the east and the south. Mm. They're, one, their directions, cardinal directions, but they're also doorways. I notice in a lot of uh, your works, you use this directional uh, well, symbolism. I it, it, it takes in a more complete picture. Uh, rather than just looking at one, one face, we've got four faces, four directions. Yeah. We honor them. We're going to... Let you try it out. It smokes real fine. Okay, yeah. That sounds great. I don't think I've ever smoked out of a... This is a peace pipe, isn't it? it referred to, yeah, in different times as peace pipe. Actually, yeah, it was I don't think the, I've ever smoked out of a peace pipe. It was the white buffalo calf woman who came and brought the first pipe. White buffalo. So a lot of your work is uh, Indian oriented. Would you say that or is it multi uh, faceted? Well, there are elders. Uh, the indigenous people in this continent were those who came before us. Uh, they have a lot to teach us. We have a lot to learn from them of what's really important. Uh, the earth is going through some great changes. You know, we're part is. of the earth. We're also experiencing these great changes. Mm -hmm. uh, the Earth's that living organism that we're all parts of. I know my life changes pretty quick sometimes. Oh boy. Yeah, this is. <laughs> There's a different a tradition to even passing it. Hey, this is Art Talk, 
And what you've just seen is Al Dugas' studio, Red Palm Studio in Mystic. And that was fascinating, Al. It was great, too. It was wonderful. It was a lot of fun. I'm not much of a drummer, <laughs> though. I don't know. That's a first for me. Well, you know, with practice, all things are possible. And you just have to feel good about offering up y your own self. Uh, Those drums sound beautiful. What a tone. What a, you know, I'd like to do that a little more at some point. The auto drumming, drumming is, is a big part of our life uh, to celebrate life itself. And that's all it is, is non-words, just through the beat of the drum. I'm happy to be here. I love my life. I love the earth and want to partake in it. Mm. Well, I do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I better beat the drum a little more. A little louder, maybe. Huh? You know, a lot of, even what art means, the word A-R-T, is that process of becoming. And, and I think that's what we're all involved in, is this becoming process. When you do anything in a creative way, some artwork, in a disciplined fashion, you open up that doorway to creation where all things are possible. That's why I bet you need a lot of time to, by yourself, to fuse everything together. I, I like That's time right. alone, yeah. Uh, so, to open that door? Spending that time in creation uh, where, where how am I going to pay for my bills doesn't come in existence. <laughs> or what am I going to do about this car <laughs> payment? Or, I mean, that is not part of that reality. Yeah, let you get you away for that instant in time. This, this place where we live, we call it Earth School. And there's no graduates here. We're all in that process of becoming human and trying to understand what that means to be human. It never ends. <laughs> it's a never-ending process. A cycle. Constantly unfolding and layers of our own coarseness fall by the wayside and mm. as more of ourselves is truly revealed. Yeah. The teachers in art school don't teach you that, though. <laughs> no, they don't. But they do give you the basics on how they, to use the tools to Open, yeah, open the doors, yeah. I, I went so to speak. several different art schools, uh, some more commercial, Vesper George School in Boston, Back Bay of Boston, and, and the Boston Museum School, which is not so commercial and, and a little bit more upfront about being an artist. Mm -hmm. uh, so take your main line into the art world. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. They really are, uh, but a Western version. Uh, that, but that even is changing now, you know. Um, well, it always shifts. The art it's, world it's always is shifting. very flamboyant. It moves and shakes all the time. But what, was, was that nerve-wracking? That high, was it high stress? That part of the art world? Commercial artwork's very high stress. Um, I worked as a, in a photo engraving department, uh, ran an art department. Uh, designing bicentennial wallpaper during the 70s. There's, there's a lot of pressure there. Bicentennial. <laughs> I remember the bicentennial. Yeah. But it works. I remember a professor in school telling me, do what you can do to live without having to sell your artwork until you're ready. Uh, until you have enough behind to, you. Until you have enough behind you. Or inside you, know, you. Know what you're all about and, and have a good handle on being an artist and the responsibilities that go with being an artist because there's always someone looking to us seeing how we're conducting ourselves in our own lives. Hmm. So you have to conduct yourself in a proper way and spend a lot of time exploring your own gift, your own uniqueness that, that makes you an artist. That, the uniqueness, that is what makes you yeah. special. And that's yeah. what we have a responsibility to share and to offer is that unique part of ourselves that we brought here. And that's what people want to see, too. Yeah. They want that, that edge, you know, that, that little extra of the person. They're not really collecting the work, they're collecting you almost know, a piece of the person. And we say, well, that, that piece of artwork is a good piece of artwork. This artist produced a good piece of work. Well, what does that mean, to be good? Yeah. To my uh, belief system, good is how much energy the artist put in. The heart. How, much, how heart? much himself or herself has she put into that piece of work? It's the energy. That's what makes it attractive. That's what makes you gravitate towards this piece of work. Yeah. It's the energy. Like, it is, too. Yeah. That's what's hot. That's when you know when you see a hot piece of work. Yeah. It's, the artist's passion is revealed in that passion. Process. There's nothing better than the passion. Hmm. Well, we're going to take a short break soon, and, we're, and then we're, we're going to cut to a commercial, and then we're going to go back up to your studio again and watch you work. Okay. And that's pretty fascinating. I'm sure the people, everybody will enjoy that. And geez, maybe we should cut, you know. Okay. <laughs>
Art is a process that fills our lives. See it. Enjoy it. This public service announcement is brought to you by the Griffiths Art Center, New London, Connecticut. Al, we had to take five, but let's continue that conversation about the passion of art. I mean, where does your passion come from? From being alive, from still being here, and, and fulfilling that reason why am I here, and uh, to sing the song that I brought here with me. And this is the passion you're putting into your work now. Yeah, yeah, and uh, no, this is part of it. And a lot of what I do, I consider, I make tools. Yes. Uh, sometimes I say tools and toys because some things are a lot more playful than others. Uh, okay. but, but these are really tools, and I think there'll be a day when we don't have to cut a body open to changing right. the energy in the body, uh, unlocking blockages in the body. There'll, there'll be no longer a need for surgeries. Boy, that would be nice. That surgery just seems to be uh, so traumatic. You know. Well, it, it, it seems to be archaic from a lot of other things we're doing, you know, as human beings it and does. expanding into the universe. And, the healing process after that takes so long, and the drugs involved. Yeah, the drugs, the drugs are worse. slowing up the healing system. Yeah, and the body worse. under proper conditions can heal itself. Um, now, the minerals that you work with in most, most of these pieces are healing. Yeah. Well, have healing qualities themselves while you work with them. And we have a lot of these minerals, the copper deposits, within our bodies. All these minerals, actually. So it, all these minerals are in the body. Uh, so it's realigning the energies that's in the body. And th these are, are a catalyst for that. Um, but, yeah, but do you have to actually work with the, the minerals and the material to absorb it? Or do you get it from just touching and... Holding. I get it working with materials uh, will pass right through you, but it's, it's not necessarily. Uh, I'm going to go back to the cake again. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you can eat some bittersweet chocolate and some sugar and some yeast, uh, some flour and, and egg yolks, and they're all going to taste different and not necessarily going to taste very well or palatable. <laughs> it doesn't taste like the cake. But once you put that <laughs> cake together, now the cake tastes very different. These are very different than they started out with. The deer antler itself is right. one piece. Once you add jet to it, and jet is a material like amber that was a vegetable material, now it's fossilized. So that changes the property of the antler. And when you bring in red coral and black coral and turquoise, that different changes energies. the antler. Now, yeah. these tools, are there certain tools for certain healings? Do you, use, do you make a certain tool a certain way for, for a specific healing? No. No. No, I make tools for people to use. Uh, so you're a healer. You have healing abilities in your hands, and most artistic people do. They're, they've got green thumbs, too. And, and having a green thumb is a validation you can bring your spirit very close to the surface. That's what heals. A body under proper conditions can heal itself. The body gets blockages. It can no longer heal itself. The energy As a practitioner, you mixed. put your hands on that body, and you become a conduit for all the energy that's available to pass through your body into this patient, into this other individual. Right. Holding one of these tools can amplify your ability or facilitate the ability to release that energy into that person as you offer up. Okay. And, and don't take any... So it's a concern about uh, the outcome of that process. Take concern about offering it up. Yeah. And that's where the healing process takes place. A tool of the mind. Yeah. It all comes, flows straight through. It's a flow, is it's what you're flow. talking about. It's a steady flow. flow. Move like the river and stand like a mountain. Yeah, <laughs> a flow is very important. Not only important to life, important to our, our everyday life, important to the next generations. All life flows through us. Hmm. And so does the artwork. What we call artwork is expressions of energy that flows through our lives. Yeah, you just don't see that much of this type of work or uh, people around. Most people that do this work anymore. do it in a very quiet way. And it's, it's not anything you would advertise for. It's part of being in service to humanity. Is that because of the belief systems we hold right now as far as um, medicine versus... A lot of it's what we've been taught and programmed uh, on a left brain ap approach to, to healing. Uh, eat too much, take this pill. Drink too much, take this pill. Uh, 
can't sleep, take this pill. Mm. And so that's where, yeah. that's where our introductions come from. <laughs> and those things usually set up a different imbalance. Okay, well, I don't want to interrupt right now, but uh, you're going to bring us up to your working studio now and show us how you put these together and the tools you work. They do take some work, yeah. Well, let's have a go at it. Okay, <laughs> let's go. Then you pass it, and so you always lead it off with the stem. So we'll do about three of these hand pieces already. What is that you're working on now? It's a rosette from an elk, a big elk. Rosette. It's just the very end of the elk horn. Very end. This is uh, the rosette is where it's fastened into the skull, and, and the antler comes out of this side here. So it makes very dense ivory, and this piece is uh, laying out on a plane. This is just like ivory, isn't it? It's just like ivory, only very, very old, uh, very hard and dry. Beautiful. But Making a, a face in there. It's, yeah, it's a wonderful medium. Yeah, trying to capture the spirit of the elk. Is that going to be a king? What is it going to be? Uh, I used to tell people it's going to be a henway, you know. A henway. You get him asked, what's a henway? It's just a relief. It's it's a face. Um, you know, if it was a stone, it'd still be a face. If it was clay, it'd still be a face. And I like working this real hard animal matter. It almost looks Eskimo, doesn't it? Like Speak, Inuit or something? Uh, Inuit, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, some people wore my jewelry, went to Alaska, and they thought the Indians up there did it. The Inuits That's what it carved looks like. it. It looks very much like it's it. It's just like, just like India. Even the drums are like the I North. I see you have different, all different stone. Uh, Oh, this here is some making beads and out of fossilized walrus ivory pieces. Oh, which was yeah. uh, when it was on the animal. This was pure white, and it's been buried and frozen in the uh, permafrost for thousands of years. So that's the difference between the uh, white off the bone yeah. and the darkness of the. This is very close to being stone now, and it has wonderful colors in it. Mm. So it's petrified, actually. Huh? It's just about petrified. This sounds is, like it sounds it's very, so, yeah, very tinkly, and it sounds yeah. a lot like stones. It's like a carnelian. It says carnelian. Carnelian. And what is carnelian? Carnelian is but like the agate family. Um, That's when beautiful. The earth was still molten. Yeah, this it's translucent. Very almost. translucent. I don't know if the camera can pick that up, but it just you can see right through. It's a lot like amber when it's a lot hotter. <laughs> a lot harder, huh? A lot hotter, yeah. And there's that serpentine I was telling you about. Very, very interesting stone. Uh, just a beautiful sea foam green. It's also where asbestos is very smooth. <laughs> it, it also has that very talky quality when you feel it. Looks like petrified wood. Yeah, it's just like talcum powder. It's just smooth and glassy. It's very striated, yeah, you know, like petrified wood. Just like petrified wood. Or bone, for that matter. Could be, yeah. It yeah. does look like bone, doesn't it? Just how different minerals minerals coagulated uh, that time when Earth was cooling off and they gathered in a certain way. Drug stores used to have a veneer on the outside of them of serpentine. Like how, green. how long have you been working with the uh, mixed? With media, I guess it's mixed media. It's all kinds of materials. Well, you know, my father was a stonemason, and he taught me the <laughs> trade early in life. And Stuck, I, eh? I figure I'm keeping up the craft, but I'm working with very light stones now. I'm not going to bend my more, back. <laughs> more, <laughs> more refined. Uh, a little easier on the back. It's the same process. It's just a lot lighter and, and scaled down. What is that green right there? That looks hard. Oh, gee, I'm trying to remember the name of this stone here. Oh, the black and the, the, the stone is predominantly green. The very dark is tourmaline, black tourmaline. There's uh, crystalline rubies that happens in a specimen, but the specimen itself, I can't remember the name of it. Now, different, different uh, materials and gems, they, they give you... Uh, well, say like the holistic ends of medicine, and they're used in all types of oh, yeah. healing purposes, aren't they? The, the one that comes to my mind most readily, and I don't have a piece of it here, is rapidolite. Uh, rapidolite is sort of a purplish stone with flakes in it, and it's where they, it's a source of lithium. 
lithium. Uh, oh, really? That's where they get people lithium People have manic depressive, you know, they have the mood swings. It's a chemical imbalance they have in their system. Lithium levels them right off. So do you just wear this? Or that? Well, it was, it was a piece that you made for jewelry. You'd wear it, or you could hold it, and your, your skin rub would, it. would pick it up. You could, you could actually remove the lithium from the stone itself by wow. holding onto it. Well, that's why, oh, boy, that's really You'd interesting. Get a good mood. So this is a soothing, well, what does bone do? What is this? What is bone when you wear bone? Structure. It's structure, huh? Uh, bones and, and the place in, in natural life uh, give structure to form. Uh, first there's an idea, then once that idea is formed, that's that first structure. It's ruled by Saturn. Your body gets gets shaped because of the uh, skeletal structure. That's right. It's all the format. And the muscles build around it. Yeah. So. Something good for architects to wear. Yeah, structure. <laughs> it's all structure. <laughs> structure in my life. And somebody that floats around a little too much. Uh, ground them a little bit. Anthropology always interests me, so I always gravitate to that physical stones and bones approach. Bones seem to last, you know, it's the last thing that's that's left from the creatures. Yeah, if, yeah, if anything, that's it. Last of it, petrified and... Primitive people made a lot of their wood. tools from bone. All the sewing needles came from the bones and thimbles. So you're just carrying out a age-old trade, basically. People Craft, trade, no, it's not, it's an art. Because most of the people that... Well, in, in other cultures that did this were considered uh, shamans, weren't they? Yeah, um, medicine people, healers. Healers. Uh, the word shaman is a shaman. Siberian word that means to heat up. What, well, Siberian? But it's anthropological name giving to the entity, male or female, who take the place of the doctor, take the place of the pharmacist, hmm. They're that intermediary, that balance between the ordinary and the and the extraordinary. Uh, you walk that wire. Actually, a balance has a lot to do with it. Yeah. Uh, a tight wire. Bones, bones play an important part in that role because they're the conductors of life. All, all blood cells born in the marrow of the bone. Uh, right. Yeah. You have problems when you with your bones, you're in trouble. Yeah. What else do you work with here? There's all kinds of... Hey, do you use any special tools or... What does it take to carve crystal and... and different, different tools. Um, and, and it's our time. You know, we consider our time real precious. There were, there were times when Indians would, and, and indigenous people would, would shape stones with rawhide and wet sand. It's just sort of working it. They'd slowly shape the work crystals, it. slowly working it. The, the way we're brought up, time is, is critical. We're always on a time schedule. We're on a deadline to meet. Uh, so we have diamond have. drills. We, we've got diamond drills, and we've got uh, electrical tools. We've got pneumatic tools. So it so speeds we, it up just a little. speed that process up. Yeah, it helps in the creative process. A little more instant gratification. Yeah, <laughs> yeah well, we tend to need that uh, more so than, than our ancestors did. We want to see results quicker, okay. as, as opposed to being part of the process. As, as the artist, you become one with that process of becoming, whatever it is. Do you think it's because we are moving through time a little faster now? I don't know if we're moving through time any faster than we, we ever did. It's our awareness. We, we've become aware of our own mortality, that all of us have so much time here. And, Hmm. It's like that decision-making process of how we spend it. Yeah, and it's speed it up. All right. Well, it's been fun talking. And, uh, let's. Well, this, we this has been a wonderful it experience. Right it's gonna tickle me plum to death too. To yeah, share I'm what glad to tell. Yeah, I'd like to hear more. To tell you the truth, I really had a good time and drumming and it's, you know that whole ceremony. And, yeah, it's been really like, fun. Yeah. It's really fun. Thanks. Welcome back. We're here with Al Dugas. This is Art Talk. And that was fascinating how you use a small tool. You know, the tools aren't very big. No, neither are dentist tools, but they can cause some serious injury. <laughs> <laughs> All repairs. They work on bone, huh? The studio looked great, you know. It was a nice viewing it from this end, and uh, it, looks, it looks wonderful. You had all kinds of antler everywhere. And, now, where do you get all your materials? I mean, you had all kinds of, you know, it's stones really and gems. And 
uh, after like, you know, it, it has been going on for like five or six years, uh, making several trips out west and learning how to trade with some native and indigenous people. So I learned about the material jet. Uh, I learned about how to use the antlers and how often they've been used and throughout history. Mm. Uh, one of my trips to North Dakota, I went out there looking for validation on my work uh, with, with the indigenous people. Not only did I find that, but there was a, a Sundance priest who was waiting for me to come. He had visions of a man coming from the east to teach him how to use the purple stones, meaning the amethyst, for protection. You already knew you were coming. So he knew I was coming. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and I got a flight for $180 round trip to Montana, which is unheard of, so I guess it was definitely intended for me to go. It meant to be. But on that journey that I went looking for my own validation, I made some wonderful contacts that, that I keep up for till this day, you know, this is Earth school, and Earth is a living organism that we're all part of. Now, is that what you would call part of the dream walk? When you pass through people like that, they're waiting, they know you're coming. Is that your walk on Earth? I mean, Well, it is, yeah, to be alive and be here is, is to partake in the Earth walk. But to do that is to live out some of our own per personal mythology. You know, we all have this journey. And, to be an artist yourself, you know how you have to look within and you have to take that underworld journey to go within yourself. And the piece of work you bring back is a validation that you took that journey. Right, right. So it's visual. So it's more than producing work. We live. We have to participate in our life. We have to participate in our own personal mythology to bring that life out of us. Do you, do you still trade? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it might sound corny and all, but uh, do, you, do you still, you know, bring things with you to, when you meet people to trade? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I learned about corals. Like, most of the red coral comes from the Mediterranean. It's getting very hard to get in its mm -hmm. raw form. Uh, but you can, you can be a trade. I mean, some things have real value. Money has only so much value. It can only buy what's available. But trading opens up a whole different world. Because that way all things have value. And I trade black coral uh, for different stones. Uh, uh, a friend of mine in New Jersey who makes some drum hoops for me, one of my students, didn't know where to get a hold of jet, and I traded him some jet for 15 drum hoops so I can make, make the hoops. And I get the hides to make the drums from somebody else and, and trade just, them some finished just work. Just a cycle. Circle. And it's a cycle. And uh, everybody real. has a little bit of everything. It, the system works. Everybody ends up feeling very happy about what they've gotten out of a trade. Mm. Nobody ends up with all of it. Nobody ends up with <laughs> all of it. <laughs> no. It's like our economy. <laughs> uh. Deer antler is harder to find right around here, even though there's so many deer here. Uh, they, they fall in the woods, and the field mice tend to chew them up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, porcupines. Yeah. All, all the woodland creatures, yeah, so we don't get to see them. Rarely do we find them, uh, and there's only so many hunters that I know, and, and they want, want them as trophies uh, to right. stick them up statically on the wall, and yeah, I, I shot Doesn't that work. animal. Yeah. This way here, the beauty of the animal still lives on, and the drums and the antlers and the flutes that I make from Usable. Them. Use everything. Use everything. The hide, the meat, everything. Make glue out of it, and you know, you eat the meat, and the hide lives on, and the hair lives on, and the, right. and the, and the hoofs and the bones. I had this. I had a friend of mine, and he came up to me and he said, uh, "He says my son keeps picking up these rocks. He walks home. He's always picking up these rocks. He says they're not special rocks. They're not pretty rocks, but they're all different. And he has this pile of rocks in his room, you know. And he says, and I just want to throw them all out." I said, no, don't do that. You know, he's, he's already feeling the energy of the stones. And he looked at me like I was, you know, insane or something. What do you think about that at that age? I mean, he's only about five, four, five. Oh, he's still, probably still a lot smarter than we are. I think young people are born knowing everything. And the more they get influenced by teachers and parents, the less they know. Oh, uh, rocks are the oldest living beings. You know, most rocks was living, alive material, breathing organic matter. That's now point. very still, but very much alive and has, has energy that young people feel the energy of it. Intuitive hands can feel the energy 
of stones. Because he zeroes right in. Zoom, those rocks. It's just driving his parents crazy, though. They're beautiful, <laughs> and they're all different. You know, here, we live so close to the ocean, so forever, we, we play with the wet stones, look how they're really yeah, beautiful. beautiful then you bring them home, and they sort of dry out, and it's, wow, it's not as nice looking. Yeah, not polished. Then you wax them up, and they, and they look a little bit wet, and then they're pretty again. Mm. But these, these stones are, are very similar. Some of them have been polished to release that beauty that's in them, to enhance the beauty that's there. They are beautiful. Some stones are just more difficult to work with. Now the crystals, do the crystals have different types of uh, energies as far as the, I, I saw in, in your shop, you had crystals all, all over the place. Why? They conduct energy. They conduct light. Crystals are a creation of Earth's wonder and Earth's magic. Mm. On a very coarse form, they use the computer chips because they vibrate. <laughs> and they vibrate anyway. The, the ones I'm fascinated with are the ones that come out of the earth just like that, that haven't been manipulated, haven't been reshaped. They're treasures from the earth, and, and they're just naturally beautiful. Uh, I think the male energies within all of us mm. tend to want to manipulate. The female energies within us tend to want to observe. So after a period of observation, I tend to want to manipulate them just a little bit. Mm -hmm. When there's fractures on them, fill it in with another stone. Put handles on them, carved out a deer antler so they look like fish and dolphins and snakes, spirally wands. And, but the female energy is making something beautiful. Well, the female energy is observing that, observing the beauty that's there, and then the male energy manipulates that just a little bit. And, but we're all made up of both, and it's the blend that's unique. It's the blend of the male-female. Yeah. I wanted to get into something a little different now. I, I've been told you do healing circles. Well, I've been taught healing circles through the uh, Brazilian shaman and mm -hmm. through the Ojibwe. But you also work with hospice and people that are in, in a different mode of healing, or maybe can't be healed. And they are two very different things. Um, I do hospice work as part of service to the community that I live in, and I've been a hospice volunteer for over five years just to help out, to help out in the community that I'm in, to assist a family that's going through the time of grief and right. sadness and loss and separation, just to help out. Uh, and there's many, many volunteers in, in throughout New London County that, that do this. And it's a team effort of, of clergy, uh, of doctors, nurses, uh, therapists, social workers. Very good program. Wonderful program. I do that to, uh, to be thankful that I am alive and went through this process. And this is something that I can do. And it doesn't make me terribly sad. The healing circle is something altogether different that I don't do with hospice patients, but I do with healthy people. So to they keep them learn how to stay healthy. You know, right. The body is like the airplane, and it's the spirit and soul within the body that knows where it's going. But the, but the body is the vehicle that needs to stay healthy. So, so we can do these people seek you out? Some do. Some do, yeah. Word some of mouth? And, and the healing circle is learning how to lay on the hands in a particular way, how to re-energize certain regions of the body. This is done through drumming. It's done through song. Yeah, people tend not to dance and sing enough. Yeah, you're That's right. True. We get too very, very serious. And we should always be willing to play just as hard as we're willing to work. Mm. It's, it's that balance of, of that release of that. Yeah, it's not a, a lot of pent-up energy when you're working for that, uh, to that point of uh, just making money or just... There's something awful empty about just working for money. And so you accumulate this pile of paper or gold or silver, and, and what good is it? You know, money yeah, you can't at, take it with you. at very best is another tool. It's now, if this tool can't work for you, right. you know, it's, it's a useless tool. Useless tool. That's when you give it to somebody else. Money can't give they you can a, use it. an hour longer to your life. Money, all the money in the world can't add that to you. Mm. Time is the most important, important thing we have. But money can buy a lot of raw materials to express ourselves with granite and marble and yes. some pneumatic air tools. And mm. 
Have you ever worked in large sculpts? I've done several big pieces. Actually, it was during uh, the early 70s when I was still pretty sick with Hodgkin's disease, and I wanted to make everything big and much stronger than I was. I did several 20, 25-foot pieces that wow. needed cranes to install them. Wow. I've gotten different arts job grants uh, during the early 70s and caught our Mondale administration. There were $250,000 available for artists to work, and, and I was fortunate enough to nice get grant. one of those grants. Now, yeah, I'd say. But once I, I was healed uh, and I, I felt I got my health back again, I was no longer really interested in leaving these huge epitaphs around the country. <laughs> is that what you really think it is, just an uh, epitaph? I, I look back at my period that? now of my life uh, and I see it like that. During the time I was doing it, uh, I remember one particular thought that younger art students will see this and it doesn't make a difference who made this piece of sculpture. They'll mm -hmm. say, well, listen, this guy got to do it. There must be some worth. I think I might want to be a sculpture and leave big physical pieces of artwork around. And, that, and that's wonderful. Hmm. I guess I worked as about as big as I can, and I've scaled it down and, and like to work with a remnant, but I feel very much as significant now as I did then. Yeah, they, yeah that shows uh, as time passes, well, you look at the Greeks and you look at the Rome, you know, the arts do yeah. pour through the Egyptians. I mean, look at the. Oh, yeah, the they pieces. had all cities. The Egyptians had cities made up of nothing but artisans that worked on tombs and worked on. What they also the find is pieces just like this yeah. alongside everything, yeah. which is amazing. Well, well really, we have to come to a closing now. Oh, it's sad. <laughs> We've been having so much fun at it. <laughs> I've enjoyed it. I've enjoyed it greatly. I hope our viewers have too. I'm sure they will. It's, it's been a, great having you on now. Very spontaneous host. Hmm. Thank you. <laughs> spontaneous guest. <laughs> well, this is our talk. And I've been your host, Jim Tripp, and I hope you join us next week and the following weeks. Good night. <laughs>